All right, what's going on everyone? So right out the gate, today's video is going to focus pretty heavily on opinion and speculation, just kind of where we are in this cycle right now. So if you're not interested in that or don't wanna hear it, this video might not be for you. You can go ahead and tune on out. But what we're gonna talk about today is why I believe that the Iranian attack on Israel a couple days ago was a major Israeli strategic victory. Uh, look at dispelling a couple rumors that I've seen pop up related to that attack. And then talk about some things to be on the lookout for as we wait to see if Israel is going to respond. It's a lot to get into, so I'm glad you're here. Now, starting out looking at this Iranian attack at Israel a couple days ago, the information we have at this point is that around 330 drones and missiles were fired from Iran, Iraq, maybe Syria, and Yemen into or directed at Israel. The vast majority of those were intercepted by Israel and Israel's allies with six to 10 detonating, impacting inside of Israel. What we've seen again at this point that, that's come out is one casualty, an airfield sustained minor damage, was quickly refilled. Looks like it's, it's back to fully operational. Uh, and outside of that, not much else uh, in terms of damage across Israel. So looking at how that played out, it's hard to view that as anything but a major Israeli victory. And the reason I say that is if you look at this series of events, starting with the Israeli attack in Damascus on April 1st, that was not just Israel striking an Iranian consulate because they don't like Iran. The target in that Iranian consulate was the senior IRGC Quds Force commander who oversaw many of the Iranian-backed militias in Syria as well as Hezbollah. Those groups are actively targeting and conducting attacks against Israeli forces every single day. So that man is very much a part of this war. I've seen some speculation that he may have been involved in the planning or the coordination of October 7th, having nothing concrete on that front, but we'll call that a cherry on top, right? Even without that, he is still very much involved in the day-to-day -day operations of this war, especially on Israel's northern front. He was the target along with his deputy and five other IRGC officers. Removing them from the battlefield in the middle of this war is a big win for for Israel, right? So Israel got that. Uh, they were able to show the effectiveness of their air defense against a massive uh, drone and missile barrage. 300 is a significant number to be launched in, in, in the span of just a couple hours. Israel is able to show the effectiveness of their air defense and the effectiveness of their allies coming to their aid to shoot down some of those missiles and drones. I believe the number I saw was that the U.S. Central Command said they shot down 80 drones and six missiles. The United Kingdom, I believe Jordan, France, maybe even Saudi Arabia and other countries were also involved with the air defense activities here. So you can take that any number of ways. Uh, those countries wanted to, had to, chose to participate in protecting Israel from this Iranian attack. Again, it, it, it shows a lot of these countries that have kind of been sitting on the sideline throughout the war in Gaza chose to take action, put some of their troops potentially in harm's way to intercept some of these munitions. That's big, right? Actions tend to speak a lot louder than words. Uh, and the last piece here that I think a lot of folks are kind of missing right now, but it's happening right in front of us, is this Iranian attack really shifted the conversation away from Israel's conduct during the war in Gaza and has really dialed everything in on what is Israel going to do? Should Iran have done that? What does the follow-on look like? How are we going to avoid escalation and so on and so forth? The pushback against Israel in Gaza has only increased in recent months, and it's gotten worse and worse for Israel in terms of international pressure to wrap this thing up and reach some sort of ceasefire. The Iranian Iran choosing to attack Israel in this manner again, 300 munitions in a short period of time, has completely shifted the conversation to, you know, whether this lasts a few days, a few weeks, or even longer, the international focus right now is not on Gaza. It's on how to avoid a broader, broader regional war. So Iran did Israel a favor in that sense in shifting the focus away from the ongoing war in Gaza. Now, it's not entirely one-sided. There are some things that Iran can point to here as well uh, in, ter in terms of victory or success around this strike. First and foremost, they can show that they saved face. They, they absorbed an Israeli strike in Damascus, took out seven IRGC officials. Iran can now say, look, we did something back. We did something unprecedented. Fired drones and missiles from Iranian territory into Israel. And they can say that they made it through the Israeli air defense network, right? We know at the very least somewhere in the six to 10 range of munitions did breach that protective layer. 
that's significant. Iran can point to that and say, hey, look what we were able to do. And we are seeing that a lot of their allies in the region are pointing to the fact that Israelis or that Israel's allies helped with the interception. They're pointing to that and saying that Israel is weak. They're collapsing. They're not able to defend themselves like maybe they could have previously. Now, that's just going to be a messaging thing, but we're already starting to see some of the Iranian proxies latch onto that. So again, from the Iranian perspective, there are a few things they can grab and say, look, success. We did what we came here to do. Now, all of this, of course, is pending what comes next, and we'll get into that here in a second. Now, there are a few aspects of this strike that I've seen circulating online. Always hard to tell how many of these arguments are being made in good faith versus not, but I've seen them pop up enough to where I felt like they were worth addressing. There's four of these that I want to run through. The first is that without the allies, Israeli air defense would have been overwhelmed. Maybe. We have no idea, right? This is complete speculation. Again, Central Command said that, that U.S. Central Command is the only nation or the only entity coming from a nation at this point that has said how much they participated in this air defense exercise. And it was 80 drones and six missiles. So there's still a lot more out there. We don't know how many the UK shot down or France shot down or Jordan. It does sound like an awful lot. Again, this was a, a U.S. announcement. An awful lot of these, these missiles did not even make it near Israeli airspace and either didn't uh, launch correctly or crashed in route. But we don't know, you know, was Israel prepared to handle all of these? If the United States and the allies had not taken part, would seven more have gotten through? 84 more have gotten through? It's complete speculation, right? We also don't know the degree that the allies were sharing intelligence and the tracking of these munitions, the launches of these munitions from Iran. There, there's a lot of different dynamics here that to just say that without the U.S., or without the U.K., France, etc., that Israel would have been overwhelmed is, is pure speculation, I would have to say. Possible, but we just don't have the information to say that definitively. Uh, the second one here is that Iran wanted all of these interceptions to happen so as to not escalate. Look, I think we're getting way too comfortable with how effective air defense is. It's like magic when you think about it, being able to shoot a missile out of the air, a drone out of the air. These drones, you talk about how slow they're moving at 115 miles an hour. Again, we're shooting things out of the sky that are traveling 115 miles an hour and having, I think with the drones, is a 100% success rate. That's not, even U.S. officials today came out and said this was way more successful than we anticipated. Nobody in Iran that was putting this thing together planned on this 98, 99% success rate. You, just, you can't. Something's going to get through. If you're launching one drone, sure. Ten drones, maybe. But when you start throwing in some of these ballistic and cruise missiles, the expectation there is not that they're going to be shot down. And we already, we did see a handful of them make it through. So Iran was targeting things inside of Israel, they just happen to not probably have the success rate they were hoping for. But again, the idea that Iran went into this expecting 100% interception or anywhere near that is is un unrealistic. They said that Iran did gather, or another uh, talking point I saw pop up out there was that Iran did this to gather air defense data from Israel. That's not really how the data flow would go in a situation like this. So when you look at the Israeli strike in Damascus on April 1st, that kind of prompted this wave of attacks, uh, Iran likely would be able to gather a lot of data from that, probably co enough cooperation with the Syrian air defenses to be able to say this is the type of munition, this was its approach path, this is where it was fired from, this was its penetrating capability, this is where the aircraft flew from, like all of that stuff, they'll have a chance at, 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 uh, being able to utilize in some way, shape, or form, but not on this end. In this case, Iran's not going to be able to gather a lot of data from the drones that were shot down over Iraq by US F-15s. There's no new data to be interpreted there, right? The ones that were shot down over the Red Sea that came from Yemen by US destroyers in the area, there's not a lot of data that Iran is getting from that. Even the ones that made it all the way to Israeli airspace, the, the missile, the drone, is not going to be able to send back the data of where was the interceptor fired from? What type of interceptor was it? And what does the air defense coverage look like? Right? So it's a bit of a stretch at this point to say that Iran launched this attack to try to gather air defense data from Israel. There's just, it's a lot of missiles and drones for very little, if any, data that Iran, the big thing Iran's going to get out of this is 300 is not going to do the trick. If they want to overwhelm Israeli air defenses, 300 at this point with the number of allies right now backing up Israel is not going to be enough. That's kind of the only big takeaway in terms of air defense. 
And the last one here is interesting because there's more information coming out now, but it's the concept that everybody was warned ahead of time. Now, on the one hand, these drones and missiles, they take a long time to move the hundreds of miles from Iran to Israel, especially, and it, the, the launch would have been detected right out the gate. This is an area everybody has been keeping an eye on Iran for this to happen. There's been speculation. Iran has said that they are going to do something, right? So there's been a lot of assets focused on identifying the launch of these munitions to give Israel as much time as possible to have a chance at shooting them all down. So even at baseline, they're going to have, you know, five, six hours maybe before those enter Israeli airspace. That's normal. But we did see some reporting earlier that Iran was sharing with countries in the region the date and maybe even the time that they were going to carry out this attack, hinting that this was more just entirely scripted and it was really just Iran showing that they could do it. It's, it's There's still mixed reporting on that front. So Iran said that through intermediaries, they told the United States the day location of the attacks. The United States responded and said, what are you talking about? The only information we got was in the middle of the strike, Iran saying that they were now carrying out their attack on Iran or uh, on Israel. So the U.S. has pushed back, said that's not realistic. Uh, but some countries in the region, including Iraq, said that they did have this information early enough to be able to close the airspace. So it's not crazy for Iran to want to share that with regional part. You think about the, the fallout here. If Iran launches one of those missiles, shoots down an Israeli commercial or a uh, an Iraqi commercial aircraft, right? It's a whole different uh, ball game at that point. So it's not crazy to warn countries in the general vicinity, especially in the flight path of these missiles. Uh, but it's not clear at this point. You know, from the reporting we're seeing, you're really going to have to take one person's word or the other in terms of the warning that went out ahead of time. Now, moving on to the escalation concerns, and there's something here that I feel like a lot of folks are missing when we're looking at this. The best way to think about how this would play out is not a matter of the Iranian military versus the Israeli military. In a, in a way, kind of, yes, but what Iran has done, their, their advantage in the Middle East over the course of the last few decades has been building out a very effective and lethal proxy network of forces, right? This includes Hamas, Hezbollah, Kataib Hezbollah, uh, the Badr Brigades. We've got the Houthis down in Yemen, multiple militias across Iraq and Syria that are affiliated with Iran. Now, there's still an argument as to how much they take direct orders from Iran. Can Iran push a button, make a phone call, and, and cause you know Hezbollah to kick off a major invasion of northern Israel? Not entirely clear, but they certainly do have some influence there. And we've seen that play out with a lot of strikes against U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria in recent years. So when you're talking about what escalation might look like here, don't think so much about you know the Israeli military going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Iranian military. Think about what happens if all of these Iranian proxies start targeting any Israeli, U.S., U.K., French um, resource anywhere across the Middle East. That is much more likely to be the scenario of what escalation could look like and is one of the reasons that the United States and others are so concerned about that. You might say, how does a war between Israel and Iran affect the United States? Well, we, we have troops in the Middle East, and an easy target, easier target for a lot of these militias will be to launch missiles, rockets, and drones against U.S. Force, US forces uh, rather than trying to carry out another attack against Israel. So this whole thing gets messy pretty quick when you're talking about these proxies. It's not very clean, uh, but it's been a challenging strategy for the United States to try to deal with and Israel to try to deal with. So any sort of escalation, you have to think about those proxies as playing a critical role. It would be silly for Iran to have spent so much time, energy, and money building this proxy network for just this reason, and then this war kicks off, and they say, no, 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 we're just going to go about it uh, by ourselves. So again, the proxies are going to play a major role one way or the other. All right. And then diving into the possibility of an Israeli response, it does sound like the United States is kind of pressuring Israel behind the scenes to call it a day and call it a, a victory and say, Hey, we did this. Maybe point to some of the things I mentioned in the video, right? Look, you took out these senior IRGC officials. You're able to show the effectiveness of your air defense. Let, let's call it, you know, one casualty, minimal damage inside of Israel. Let's call it a day and, and move on. Kind of sounds like what the United States, the official position the U.S. is pushing there. And worth noting, the U.S. has said that they are not going to participate alongside Israel on any strike inside of Iran. I can understand, however, that there is a, a pretty significant push inside of Israel right now for a serious response. 
and it's, it's easy to see this. I mean, if we just swap ourselves out, imagine that there was a, a Russian attack against the United States. This, you know, comp comparison is not going to be perfect, but if they fired 300 munitions against the United States and all of them were intercepted, except like six to 10 that impacted the United States, even if they didn't cause casualties or significant damage, can you imagine the U.S. population just saying, whew, close call, glad we made it. Let's move on with our life. No, there would be so many calls for retaliation and to make sure that Russia or whoever carried out that attack could never do that again, right? So I can understand the Israeli view of wanting to do something about this. Uh, the, the challenge here, of course, is how to do something that doesn't continue this cycle of escalation. Now, I mentioned that not doing something could also be a form of escalation. And what I'm getting at there is that Iran launching 300 munitions against Israel is... Is, it's a historic event. It hasn't happened before. So if Israel does not do anything following this, it kind of shifts that uh, threshold for what Iran views as acceptable behavior, if you will, against Israel before military action would take place. So the idea there kind of is if Iran gets away with this, with no repercussions, no fallout, no punishment, what happens if they decide in a month to launch five missiles? against Israel. How are you going to take military action against Iran when they launch five missiles if you didn't do anything when they launched 300? So does that mean that the threshold for military action and military response has now been moved up to 300 munitions being fired at Israel? It's kind of the escalation challenges that all the countries are having to navigate here. Um, but that's the kind of thing worth keeping an eye on here as more information comes out in the coming days and weeks. But that's all I got for now. Of course, if interested in this or other national security subjects, be sure to check out our Substack linked in the description below. It's called Between the Lines with Preston Stewart. And I mentioned it yesterday. We were putting out articles talking about Hezbollah and their capabilities, the Iranian strategy, the proxy strategy across the Middle East, the military industrial complex of Iran. It's a real thing. Uh, and it's noteworthy given how this conflict is playing out right now. All of that is linked in the description below if interested. But thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.